trailer. Okay. Okay, once more, uh, good evening, everybody. Welcome to the session, What Has Red Achieved? Empirical Evidence for Transformational Change. Um, why are we here? Why are you here? If you have a fever, you go to the doctor, or you, maybe you, first you pop a, an aspirin or something, and then if it doesn't get better, you go to the doctor. If it doesn't get better, you don't go to the clinic. You still have the fever after going to the clinic, maybe you start praying. But the, whole, the important thing is you're acting on evidence. You have something that you measure, your fever, and, and you react to it and try to, uh, to control this. So it's sim pretty simple, we humans do it all the time. Uh, and we are sometimes a bit surprised that we don't see this happening so much in policy processes. There's very rarely uh, an assessment of policy impact, and that's what this session is about, uh, talking about the example of Red Plus. And um, so this is, I'm just uh, going to introduce you to the, to the session. My name is Christopher Martius. I'm a team leader for climate change in, in C4, the Center for Tropical Forestry Research. And this session is jointly organized by us together with the Independent uh, Evaluation Unit of the Green Climate Fund and Wageningen University. And we are very proud that we have this collaboration uh, starting in, in small ways and in larger ways, uh, working together on, on, the, on these important questions. And uh, so we would like to share some of these results with you and, and another partner in this is FAO. Uh, where we all, where we're also going to have a speaker. Um, so the speakers are uh, starting with Kama Chering, who is a Green C uh, Climate Fund board member, uh, and uh, he's from Bhutan. We have Dr. Joe Puri, who, who leads the independent assessment unit of the Green Climate Fund, um, and she's going to talk. We have Dr. Amy Duchel. Uh, who is my colleague in C4, working on uh, assessment of Red Plus projects. Then we have Dr. Martin, or Professor Martin Harold uh, from Wageningen University, also talking about the topic. And we have Margot Bushko Briggs from FAO. So it's a, a long setup of speakers for this late hour. And um, we have Professor Harold Angelsen, a professor for economy at uh, uh, the Norwegian University of Life Sciences, uh, who is going to moderate the session. And um, as I said before, we have a long list of speakers, so we, I'd like to ask all the speakers to uh, keep to your time, please, so we, we don't eat up the time for discussion that is planned uh, for, for the last half hour, more or less. So we have somebody showing you here. Uh, when, it, when you have two minutes to go and, and then when you are close to finishing. So please stick to the time. And with this, I'd like to hand over to Harold for the moderation. I'm, uh, I'm just going to sit here. And uh, I would like to add also, we have a, a, a questioning, a questions maybe coming in from an online audience to the session. This is live streamed. And so we might in the discussion also refer to those questions. So if you're not sitting in the room, but listening to this outside, Please send us uh, uh, your questions through this Skype setup that is, that is available. Thank you. Good afternoon. Um, Chris has already introduced, so it's my privilege to be the moderator, not in the meaning of being moderate, but rather to ask the questions that you all wanted to ask but don't dare to do. Um, this is, as you know, a, a joint event between primarily C4 and, uh, and, the, and the Green Climate Fund. C4, we are using this, I'm associate also with C4, 
using this occasion to launch a new book, Transforming Red, that uh, Amy, Christoph, myself, and three others have been contributing to as editors and also a number of 62 authors. The book is available on the back, and uh, you may have a copy there or, of course, view it online. I have a confession to start with. I was wrong when I got involved in RED, first COP 10 years ago in Poznan, here in Poland. I thought that after 10 years we would have a number of good impact studies. We would know, does RED work or not? We would know what policies work better than others, what type of projects work in which context. After 10 years, billions of dollars and Norwegian kroner, we would know all this answer. And now we are here to take stock and maybe see, I was wrong, we have far fewer, there are a few key questions that we cannot fully address or answer properly to guide us. We are here, however, to take stock and both of the work that we'll see presented here, to see what do we know and where are we. And some of this, including this book, is kind of a critical analysis written by researchers that we want to be critical. And that's good. We should be critical about the implementation of RED. But to read from the back of this, without losing sight of the urgent need to reduce forest-based emissions to prevent catastrophic climate change. So I think when we have this critical attitude to see what works and not, we have tested a few approaches, but that does not mean that we are critical to the objective of RED, namely to reduce forest-based emissions. So with that, I'm happy to give the floor to the third speaker, uh, who is a board member of the GLF, Karma Tsering, but as Christoph also said, working with the National Environmental Commission Secretariat of the great country of Bhutan. So, Mr. Karma, the floor is yours. And I encourage you to come here to speak. Uh, it's kind of more authority. Thank you. Uh, uh, first of all, uh, it, it, whenever I come to podium, I feel like a politician. Like, that's why I try to avoid coming to the podium to speak. Uh, anyways, thank you. And thank you again to the Independent uh, Evaluation Unit, uh, direct, uh, head of the Independent Evaluation Unit, uh, Dr. Joe Puri, who has been kind enough to give this opportunity to me to, to share some of my views. Uh, please don't be disappointed to hear that uh, when I say I'm not an expert on Red Plus, I'm not an expert on Red Plus at all. I'm here just to lend support as a member of the GCF board uh, to this process uh, since the Red Plus uh, has also been introduced in GCF. Uh, of course, in, in the context of the GCF, the Red Plus has been introduced just now uh, to look at the mitigation. Uh, however, I think uh, we have other elements which can also be uh, done by the countries in terms of other areas like increasing in terms of the livelihood of the country and then communities and region, people's health. So these are some of the areas that we have been also trying to see how can be incorporated within the GCF portfolio for the Red Plus. Uh, the Red Plus project uh, was launched in GCF uh, to some, uh, in sometimes in 2017 uh, with the uh, funding size of about 500 million project based on the first come first service uh, kind of a thing for the countries to access the fund. Uh, just now, the the one of the areas that uh, the GCF is also focusing is. To, to some extent, from our own perspective, uh, it is also a learning perspective for, for member countries who are, who are trying to get access from the GCF. Uh, we feel that there are lots of areas which is also already happening in, in the Red Plus by different donors and different expert agencies in terms of the support to different countries. For instance, uh, in my own country, we have already now started quite a lot of uh, assessment and we are now we have our own uh, uh, Red Plus strategy, which is, is again needs to be implemented. 
my personal, uh, as a member of the board, and also having been in this process I, uh, for last two years, I, I feel that uh, member countries who are also trying to get access through the Red Plus has to be, be kind of proactive for, especially for accessing this fund from the GCF. But at the same time, I think some of the member countries are also quite advanced in terms of their own developments in the Red Plus. Uh, so this is what uh, uh, the, uh, the challenges that uh, we, we are facing, especially in the, the LDC countries among the developing countries in terms of the uh, Red Plus. Uh, I just wanted to cite uh, uh, one, one uh, critical area of uh, uh, support that the Bhutan in particular uh, is looking forward in terms of getting the support is like in terms of uh, uh, trying to implement their own strategies of Red Plus. We have now already done the, the develop the, 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 the Red Plus strategy uh, through the, the, the Forest Carbon Partnership Fund, uh, which was uh, uh, allocated to Bhutan. But saying this, uh, one of the area that Bhutan also has in terms of the challenges is the, especially like many other developing countries, from the among the developing, especially the LDCs, the challenges is the expertise within the, the Red Plus. Uh, one of the, even within the GCF context, we have, we are also trying to clarify in terms of the, the so many definition in terms of criteria that has been put forward. For instance, uh, now we are trying to say, we have this so-called paradigm shift, which is required but we, we are also not very sure what it means in terms of the paradigm shift. There, there are different views that is being expressed. So these are some of the, from the, the GCF and the convention point of view, which is also very much uh, confusing for the member countries. These are some of the challenges, but this is also to my view is an, uh, the opportunity for country to look at how it is being viewed and how it is being implemented in the, the context of REST plus. Uh, so, finally, I, I have not much to say, as I was saying, but I, just, I, have, I have come here to just to give uh, you know, the moral support uh, of being a board member uh, representing LDC. So, I would like to stop here, and I, I do not want to <laughs> delay any further and not speak much on the Red Plus, uh, since we have experts who are there here to deal on the, on the red, uh, red issue. Thank you very much. Thank you so much um, to get that perspective of that of GLF, which is really going to be the, the kind of the main funding arm of, of uh, UNFCC. Next speaker is Amy. I'm going to switch a little bit to, because Joe's presentation will partly build on what Amy. So Amy is a senior scientist at CIFOR. She has been working on uh, particularly M2, the module two that has tracked starting with 23 red projects, and now we're doing a third wave of, not the full 23, a third wave of, of, uh, of data collection on that. Great. Hi, I'm Amy Duchelle, as Harold said, from C4. And I want to thank you all for being here tonight after a long day. What I'm going to talk about today is understanding what works in forest-based climate change mitigation from some of our experiences at C4 over the last 10 years. So as all of us know who are here today, um, we cannot stay below 1.5 degrees warming without forests, protection of forests, recovery of forests, and sustainable forest management. And what we really want to know is, you know, what have different types of forest-based mitigation actions achieved um, so far to inform future efforts? And, and we argue at C4 that rigorous impact evaluation is needed. So rigorous impact evaluation of different types of forest interventions to really understand what works best, where, when, 
why and how much does this cost to be able to inform, to promote learning, but also inform future efforts. When we say rigorous impact evaluation, I mean, we're really just talking about attributing an observed outcome to a given intervention, whether it's a policy, a program, or an activity. So a really nice review of different types of forest conservation policies came out in PLUS One in 2016, and this was led by a colleague of ours. At, uh, his name is Jan Borner. He's a C4 senior, uh, C4 senior associate and also a professor at the University of Bonn. And what they did was look at a variety of forest conservation policies, ranging from protected areas to payments for environmental services, different kinds of law enforcement, so command and control measures, um, and, and certification, among others. And essentially, the conclusion, I mean, this graph isn't so easy to understand, but basically, they were looking at basically the percent of, of reduced forest loss because of these different intervention types using a quasi-experimental approach, so actually a counterfactual, trying to understand, you know, what was the actual effect of the intervention um, in a treated area versus a control area. And essentially the, the outcome or the, the conclusion of these studies, this collection of studies, was that you know, effects are actually quite small. There are not super effective, let's say policies, programs, at least that were analyzed here. Um, and, and that there's a lot of variance of, of the, the effect. So the long whiskers that you see on some of these, um, these results show that the, they're sort of imprecise results. And so quasi-experimental approaches, there's very high internal validity because you're actually using a counterfactual. But what they found from these studies is that they were often case specific. So it was hard to you know, take them out of the particular context where they were being applied to learn lessons for other contexts. And, and that would be external validity. And so then we tried to do a, a review of the Red Plus literature um, to understand you know, what have we learned about Red Plus, and, and especially in terms of some of the more global comparative studies and things like this. And essentially what you see here are different types of studies, so reviews, um, randomized controlled trials, um, quasi-experimental approaches, which are, so those are in red, the randomized controlled trials, the quasi-experimental approaches, and then other case comparisons, and then at the, the bottom, case reports, looking at different types of outcomes. So the carbon outcomes are in black, the non-carbon outcomes like well-being, livelihoods, tenure are in kind of gray, and participation outcomes are in, in white. And something striking about this was the, the lack of studies that are experimental, either experimental or quasi-experimental, so the lack of ability to actually attribute an observed outcome to a given intervention, but then also a remarkable lack of focus on carbon or land use outcomes, especially given that that was the original um, primary focus of Red Plus. Of course, other co-benefits are, are as important, we would say, but, it, but it's interesting, the lack of studies on carbon outcomes. So C4's global comparative study on, on Red Plus, I mean, some of those, there's one randomized control trial. So the graph before, there was one randomized control trial. That's um, Jaya Chandra. Man many of you might know that study. It's from Uganda. It was um, on a PEDS program. <coughs> And, and the other, both basically the level down are the quasi-experimental, and most of those are actually coming from our work, which is impact evaluation of, of local initiatives on the ground. And so basically since 2010, we've worked on, uh, in six countries, Brazil, Peru, Cameroon, Tanzania, Vietnam, and Indonesia, in 22 initiatives in 150 villages and with 4,000 households. And essentially we collected data um, before, Inter interventions were happening in 2010. After, it wasn't actually after, it, was, it ended up being during, in 2014. And then we've gone back this year to collect a third round of data um, in, in 2018 at a subset of the sites. And the idea here is that you're working in treatment and control areas to try to understand what the impact is of these given interventions. So, what are some of the results so far from our work, but also from the broader literature? Um, basically, the few evaluations of local Red Plus initiatives on forest and land use outcomes show moderately encouraging results. And I should actually say that when we do these literature reviews, we were very open to any type of, of, of Red Plus initiative at any scale, but most of the literature has focused on these pilot projects. 
Um, you know, there are strong limitations with a project approach. I think a lot of us know that. But the bundle of interventions that are being used at these local sites, ranging from payments for environmental services, alternative livelihood enhancements, tenure clarification, these kinds of interventions, it's important to understand what the impacts are because they could be used in, in higher level jurisdictional programs. So we did find actually moderately encouraging results of the few um, studies that focus on carbon and land use outcomes at the local level. Social and other environmental outcomes, we found that well-being effects were small with a mixed sign, but more likely to be positive when incentive components are included. I think this result is really important because we hear, you know, Red Plus is such a highly charged ideological subject, and I think a lot of sides are saying, ah, oh, Red is great for local people, Red is terrible for local people, and a lot of this is not necessarily based, it may be based on a site or a really strong experience, but, but when we did this sort of broad study, these broad reviews, we actually see that um, the impacts have been small overall on well-being and, and more likely to be positive when there are incentives. Land tenure is still a persistent challenge, um, and interestingly, studies on biodiversity and adaptation outcomes are still extremely scarce. Finally, I want to um, highlight some, for, uh, some new research on subnational jurisdictional approaches, and this is led by my um, colleague at Earth Innovation Institute, too, Claudia Stickler, who's sitting there. Hi, Claudia. Um, and, and this is promising research because what we've done is looked at um, nearly 40 subnational jurisdictions across the tropics, and, and um, basically found that most of these states and provinces have made very strong commitments to reducing deforestation. And most of them have put into place policies, programs, or initiatives of some kind towards reaching those goals. And the next step of that work that's already started is actually looking at the impacts, and so assessing rigorously the impacts of certain interventions in the bundle on the outcomes that we're observing on the ground, both environmental and social. And they're having us, uh, Earth Innovation is organizing a side event on Monday, so, so please, where that report will be presented, so please go to that. So let me end. Um, with some of the takeaway messages from our work, there's a need for more reliable evidence on the impacts of forest-based mitigation. Forests are critical. We need to know more about what works in terms of policies, programs, and, and initiatives. There are huge challenges in evaluating impacts in a rigorous way, um, especially in terms of real-world policy and programs that are constantly evolving. The choice of controls, if you're trying to do something quasi-experimental, the results are highly sensitive to how you choose your controls. There's a diversity of interventions. When you, know, when you talk about Red Plus, it's not just payments for environmental services, it's many things. So how do you parse out the different effects of the different interventions in the bundle? And then how do you get at the real effects versus general noise of data? These are all huge challenges that, that researchers are struggling with. So we're calling for a scientific upgrade and impact evaluation. So really looking at the social and environmental impacts of a diversity of interventions in the same place. And this has been coined Conservation Impact Evaluation 2.0. I think this is the kind of information that we need as we move forward, um, especially with Red Plus at a, at a jurisdictional scale. So thank you. Thank you so much. Kept your time. Joe Puri is head of the uh, Independent Evaluation Unit of, um, of the Green Climate Fund. I still have a problem with GCS and GCF. The one is the study, the other is the, uh, the fund. So please, I'm trying to get the, your presentation. Thank you so much, Harold. I'm Jo, and um, I work with the Independent Evaluation Unit, and I'm going to talk about evidence in forests and what's next. And um, up front, right up front, I do want to say that I really appreciate the work that Harold and Amy and Christopher and C4 um, at large has done in looking at <coughs> what works with respect to um, forestry and with respect to Red Plus. Um, mainly because this is something that we are trying to investigate and examine uh, also at the independent evaluation unit, not just with respect to forestry, but you know, with respect to a whole lot of initiatives that the GCF looks at. So today I'm going to look at two things. First, 
bias, and the second thing is behavior, yeah? So let's talk about bias first. If I was to ask you what are the top few things that can help to individually reduce greenhouse gas emissions? Quick answers, I'll wait. I can wait, Vanu, Vani, please don't count my time. It's theirs. <laughs> mm. So, any answer, one answer. Flights. Flights, great. Anyone else? Meat, yeah. So, top four things that can help to individually reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Clearly, having fewer children, living car-free, avoiding a transatlantic flight, we are not doing very well and consuming a plant-based diet, yeah? And the amount of greenhouse gas emissions that you mitigate ranges from 59 tons per person per year, from f if you have one fewer child, to 29 tons per person per year if you consume a plant-based diet, yeah? And of course, it varies by context. But I'm just saying averages. And so there was, there's been a lot of studies, and, but this particular study that was published in Nature basically looked at this um, um, experience in developed countries. So Australia, United States, Canada, etc. Okay, that's good. But guess what? Now let's look at what are the sorts of international policies that, or policies that we adopt at the international agency level to when we are thinking about greenhouse gas emissions, yeah? In any kind of evidence and evaluations, unfortunately, we don't talk, unfortunately, about what is most effective. We talk about whether what we are doing is effective. So we already presume that the strategies that we are employing are already effective, and we only look at whether the implementation of those strategies are effective. But clearly, that needs to change. That needs to change because our paradigms are shifting very clearly and very manifestly. I mean, the Special Report 1.5 is showing that. Our paradigm has ch changed. Why aren't we re-examining the strategies that we are using? So, now to also speak to some of the points that Amy made. A couple of years ago, my co-authors and I, we looked at the evidence on uh, land use and the impact that this has. So land use policies, we looked at area and for, I don't need you to look at the slide. Don't try and make out what's in the fine print. It's fine print for a reason, yeah? I don't need you to read it. So um, the, the, we tried to look at some evidence and we tried to understand, well, okay, to what extent are area management techniques, law and enforcement, incentives, training, all of that, helping to bring about a change in forest cover. Are these policies effective, essentially? And we looked at everything that's going on in developing countries. And we looked at all of the evidence that we could count as good quality evidence. So the causal attribution that Amy talked about, we looked at evidence that shows in a causal attributable way the evidence that's telling us whether our policies are working or not, but only in developing countries and for all years ever. Okay, so what did we find? Again, don't, so the bubbles, the little round bubbles essentially show you, um, you know, some types of evidence. But we basically found, our headline message was, we found 221 studies that qualified. And these are in developing countries. So that's the one caveat. Only two studies looked at cost effectiveness. Amy spoke about, you know, how few studies there are in red plus that look at, and there's one um, that, you, that uses randomized control trials to understand causal attribution. Guess how many in red plus actually include costs when they're trying to understand cost effectiveness? Zero. When you look at forestry studies, only two studies at large really looked at cost effectiveness. So if you're a policymaker, you have no idea what to do if you've got $10 to spend. And you definitely don't know, even for zero, 0 to 0 0.5 standard effect size, whether you should be spending it on forestry or something else. So that's not very good. And zero of those studies actually connected all of this with greenhouse gas emissions. Yeah. And these are high quality studies but they look at intermediate outcomes and they don't look at far out outcomes. So, first point is we have bias in what we produce, in the kind of evidence that we produce, and we have to start to change that. So, 
My lesson one, let's consider bias and how we produce evidence. Now, I'm going to go to less, the second thing that I want to talk about, which is behavior and ensuring that we measure the last mile, okay? Science, ladies and gentlemen, is not enough. I know I'm saying this to the wrong audience. Okay, but look at obesity, look at drug use, look at smoking, look at alcoholism. We all know that some things are bad. They're privately and personally bad. And we still don't adopt behaviors that are personally good for us. Why do we expect people to change their behaviors when they're thinking about climate change? We have to start thinking about this in a very different way. So, energy programs, recycling, taxes for on, you know, for energy, etc., land use, anything related to climate change, insurance policy programs, they all have something common to them. Con let me give you an example of crop insurance. My co-authors and I looked at this a while ago and we, said, we looked at crop insurance being provided to smallholder farmers in developing countries. And we looked at all of the evidence again, evidence review, and we found that of the 50 studies that qualified, in those studies, the uptake of actuarially fair insurance policies, so it was actually good for farmers to buy it from the insurance company, the uptake was at a maximum of 30%. If you basically cracked 30%, you succeeded. And then that fell off. The attrition rate was even greater in the second year. So unless you provide incentives or really link it with you know, other social programs, farmers, smallholder farmers do not want to buy insurance programs. Why is it that we keep thinking about these programs without thinking about, about the behavior change that it demands of them? So, the key point here is that something happens in that last mile. We can have agencies and organizations putting policies out there and thinking about supply-driven stuff, but we have to start looking at that last mile. How do we change behavior? Okay. Um, okay. I'm going to, so addressing the last mile is really, this is the work that's now been done by Richard Taylor, Kahneman, um, Tversky, et cetera, Nobel Prizes have been given, and you're really pitting the cognitive part of your brain with the contextual part. And you're thinking about how to change the choice architecture. How can we change that so that people are making the right decisions for themselves and making the right choices for themselves? I'm going to give you one example, and this is of doctors. Doctors know that they have to wash their hands. Of course, who else would know that better, right? Um, Okay, so, but it, there was a study that was done in the United States and found that there were 100,000 lives that were lost primarily because surgeons did not wash their hands going from one surgery room to the other. 100,000, that's significant. So, what did um, these researchers from the University of Miami along with Imperial College of London do? They looked at installing hand sanitizers at the entrance of surgery rooms. Yeah? And they said, okay, well, would that help? But then they also did something else. They installed, they, did treat, they also constructed treatment groups. They put men's eyes on top of uh, hand sanitizers. They also put women's eyes on top of hand sanitizers. And in the third treatment arm, they sprayed lemon scent in front of surgery rooms. And guess what the impact was? So control group, you install the hand sanitizer, yes, hand sanitizing behavior went up by 15%. When you installed women's eyes photographs, it went up to 21 or 22%, yeah, basically a six percentage point increase over the control group. With men's eyes, it was definitely much more effective yeah, than women's eyes, so about double. But, sorry, when you look at spraying the lemon scent, it triggers something off in your brain. With lemon, you associate antiseptics, and you associate cleanliness. And they ended up washing their hands increased to 47%. So we've got to start to think about things like that when we are thinking about the last mile. So there's a lot of work that's been done in this space. Think about how you can affect or change norms to change behavior. Work done by the Behavioral Insights team um, in London looks at how we use energy. 
and comparisons between us and our people around us that we associate with definitely changes our energy behavior, energy use behavior. Okay. Um, I know I have to make the last statement, Vani, so give one minute, please. So, think about some of the things that we can alter as we start to think about this. Change the default. In the United States, what has been tried and tested now is if you change the default in organ donation and make that the default choice rather than the opt-in choice, that has changed organ donors to 80%. Yeah? So, if we can do that, for example, getting renewable energy, as the default choice, and then non-renewable is the opt-in choice. Let's see how that works. Think about priming. And the example here is smaller plates. Even if you're at a buffet table, put smaller plates. People will eat less. Think about salience. And the example here is having fruits closer to you and the donuts further away. That's just easier for you to reach out to the fruits rather than the donuts that are lying further away. And last thing is ego. So again, behavioral scientists have looked at this, and in the context of Halloween, so little kids, one group, the control group, was not asked anything, but was just told, please pick up only one piece of candy. The other groups were, to, were asked for their names and were asked for their addresses. The group that was asked their addresses and names were much more likely, little kids, were much more likely to pick up one piece of candy than the control group. If you put mirrors behind candy jars, the little kids can see themselves. They're much more likely to pick up one piece of candy than not. So, basically, let's think about the last mile and what changes behavior. And my last two messages are, think about a no regrets up pathway. Consider bias and how we produce and use evidence and think about the last mile and what changes behavior. Thank you. Thanks a lot. So now we have some practical advice. For example, don't get more children. I just, want, <laughs> I just wonder, you have one less child. I mean, it depends on the reference point. I have four fewer children than my grandparents, so I've done quite a good job there. Um, next speaker is from one of the partners of C4, as, namely Martin Harrell, who is a professor of remote sensing and GIS at the Wageningen University in the Netherlands. Yeah, thank you very much. Good afternoon, everyone. Is it actually on? It's, it's not so easy yeah. to understand yeah. on stage. Um, Maybe I use this, this one. It comes. Hello? Yeah, that's a bit easier. At least I hear myself a bit louder. So uh, when we talk about Red Plus and we also talk about Red Plus achievements, we also have to talk about data and open data and transparency. And there is a a lot of stuff that has happened since Red came on. And uh, before I go into that in a bit more detail, I would also like Amy remind us that this interest and this need for forest-related mitigation is basically as strong as ever with this IPCC 1.5 report, with all the information we have and we have looked at, that the forest sector is an important contributor to achieve the climate goals and it's actually a permanent one. It's not different than any other sector to do that and we should really not overlook the opportunities there because sometimes we have to explain ourselves as forest people uh, to that and I, I think we have moved beyond that. So that's my starting statement. We do know that the forest and the land use sector is relatively complex too. And that's where information is also coming to play a role, that we talk about transformational change, it requires engagement, it requires information, it requires assessment of performance, and that is not only related to the things that we talk about here at the COP, related to the global stock tech, where we have to kind of work out how these various uh, sources of information have to come together to give us a general, uh, uh, well, a number on how close we are to 1.5. Um, we have about a transparency framework that we hope to hear much more about at the end of this COP. Um, but we also have to understand that information is very important and open sharing of information is important really to engage stakeholders, to really foster participation, to jointly learn, and to really help the accountability of stakeholders that are actually active in land use sector mitigation. 
And so that is really where also data information play a role. Because we have been focusing a lot on really helping countries to bring their reporting capacities up to speed. All of Red, all Red Plus countries have improved their capacities. They use a variety of data sources to report, to develop reference levels, and these kind of things. And that has been a great achievement. What we have not seen a lot, and that's what I would like to give three examples on, is really how the data and some of the data sources are, be, are used beyond that specific course. So the first example I'm going to give is about, so this is a map, it's, it's sample points, uh, so sampling, we'll, we'll monitoring, we do sampling every now and then, which shows you, the color shows you what is the land use that follows tropical deforestation. So green, and that's mostly in Latin, Amer uh, in Latin America, you see a lot of conversion to pasture. In Africa, you see a lot of uh, orange colors, which is basically smallholder agriculture, and you see in Southeast Asia, some pinkish colors, which is tree crops or, or oil, oil palm and so on. So this, you're starting to really observe land use. This is based on satellite data. And you say, this is great information. It tells us about the drivers. It tells us the things that are happening on the ground. But then if you look at the studies in countries on how such information has actually impacted debates and uh, discourses about deforestation, this information is not often picked up because there are often strong coalitions related to business as usual that have really dominated these debates. So we have not really done very well on using that information also for, that, for these purposes. The IPCC good practice guidelines that the countries are using to, to report are just being revised, updated, and that's particularly important for Red Plus because the last update was 2006, basically before Red Plus came really saw the light of day. So a lot of new input in these guidelines are related to what developing countries uh, should be doing in terms of estimation and reporting. One of the updates that are, is also ongoing at the same time is to update these default values. So default values are information that can be used in absence of data, in absence of national data. They're used sometimes for technical assessments. They are actually also used in the scientific literature and also for local impact studies and so on. And so all these tropical biomass and forest growth data have been updated. And the, the nice point here is it was a relatively open collaboration between research networks, between countries providing data, the FAO and UNVET providing data, the World Bank Carbon Partnership Facility providing data to actually really do a good job in, in updating these numbers, right? And so in an area where, you know, data sharing and open data is, remains an issue, we see very positive signs that these partnerships are really starting, starting to happen and really take advantage of all these data sources coming together. And that's, and that's a very good sign. And my last point is really related, and that's also a satellite-based tool, when you have very frequent satellite data, and there are some data from the European Space Agency that are related to the uh, Copernicus program, where you actually provide weekly information, even in cloudy areas such as uh, Indonesia, so this is data about Riau, where you provide weekly updates about what's changing. So what you're seeing here, this is a, an oil palm plantation which is actually being harvested and re regrown. So what you're seeing mostly is actually land management. This is not land use change, this is land management. Um, but it points out that with these very dense time series data, you start to track spatially explicitly on what's happening on the, on the land, also related to land use. So we start to see opportunities to use information not to report what's coming out at the end, but to really track, to near real time assess, and even you know, use that info, information for action to, for example, you know, assess if there's anything illegal, given a certain def, def, definition, uh, using it for enforcements, and all these, all these kind of things. So basically, to sum up, um, open tools and data, and data, data sources are really fundamental for enhancing transparency, underpinning country cap cap capacities. Countries have used a lot of open source tools and data on stakeholder en engagements and to support the accountability of, of stakeholders. Um, we, have, we have underused the available data to, for exactly really assessing options, assessing trade-offs, and really to support the implementation 
we had a lot of focus on actually reporting what's what we're expecting to come uh, come out. So if we talk about transformational changes and using information to underpin these transformational changes, we have to do much better there. And the opportunities are there. And so this idea of more spatially explicit tracking on what's happening is something that is becoming feasible. Thank you. Thanks a lot, just on time. So all the speakers should be commanded for that. Um, last speaker, I, was, I thought if I should ask, if I should introduce her as, a rep, as an indigenous representative because it's the only Polish speaker in the panel, but uh, Malgo busko Briggs is a uh, program officer with FAO and, and then the, of course the, the UN Red program, where FAO is one of three partners in the forestry department. So you have the floor and soon you will have the presentation. Good evening, everybody. Dobry wieczór. If there is anyone uh, from Poland, good. Dobry wieczór is good evening in Polish. So just to prove that I'm uh, <laughs> partly indigenous. So thanks a lot. And uh, first of all, I'd like to um, congratulate C4 and uh, all the authors and contributors for your new publications. That's uh, very impressive. And thank you all for putting this uh, interesting event together. Um, what do I? Um, I'd like to contribute to these uh, discussions, which I think is very, very timely, to look into uh, evidence of Red Plus and what, uh, and what, in principle, you know, Red Plus achieved in terms of its catalytic role and transformation. So a couple of observations, you know, on, uh, on that from our perspective. I represent the UN Red Program. I'm going to tell you a little bit where we work and what we do, and a little bit about our experiences of 10 years of capacity building and capacity development on, on Red Plus. And then a few takeaway messages from, from, from our side. So just uh, for... For those of you who may not be familiar with UN Red program, although I think that many of you are very familiar because it's not a new program, uh, we have been established as a response to UNFCCC decisions already in 20, 2008. And this program is a partnership of FIO, UNDP, and UN Environment, and um, um, with major support from uh, Norway, Denmark, Japan, Luxembourg, Spain, Switzerland, and the European Union. Um, it was actually, believe me or not, the first joint global UN program on climate change by the time when it was established in the size and the shape uh, that it took. Uh, we've been working in 64 partner countries and uh, it, for the time being, the program uh, first through quite large interventions in specific countries and a lot of smaller targeted interventions on capacity development in more than 45 countries has been now changing into somehow um, um, sort of a global uh, knowledge hub related to technical issues. Now, uh, as this event is talking and dealing with the issue of evidence and also the, the issue of transformational change towards climate mitigation in the forest sector, I think Red Plus, when it when started, when launched in 27, was actually meant to be very quickly transformational. But today we know that achieving these results requires much time longer than it envisaged initially. So a few words on this, how we look at it and how the program, uh, the UN Red program was set up. In its first phase, for the first 10 years, we've been working on a Red Plus readiness phase, phase one. And we're supposed to finish this and accomplish and then help countries to develop all the capacities, infrastructure, have it sustainable, and then move to implementation and results. I think from our experience, we can say, and we've been trying to uh, explain this on the graph, is that this readiness phase, in order to be sustained, requires quite some more, quite some more um, attention. And the three phases of RED can actually be happening in parallel. And I'll tell you a little bit more on how we have looked at this uh, capacity development and, uh, and the evidence. So in order to look specifically into um, one of the uh, RED Plus readiness pillar, National Forest Monitoring Systems, as you know, data, information, transparent and reliable and accountable is a prerequisite for RED Plus. And Martin can tell you a lot more about this. Um, as you have seen also in the previous presentation. 
Um, so all the Red Plus countries were supposed to develop sustained and, and, and firm national forest uh, monitoring system and one of the pillars. So we've looked into a 10 years of capacity development. We've invested substantial amount of money into this and uh, driven primarily by a desire to understand you know, what truly has changed you know, and where are the gaps and how and why those gaps exist and how to fill in these gaps by uh, targeted um, interventions. I should also say that, uh, you know, reporting on forest resources, it's actually nothing new. Uh, for FIO forest resource assessments, uh, countries were reporting to FIO for last 50 years. But things have been changing during the last uh, 10 years substantially. So here's one example, and I'll show this graph. Uh, on National Forest Monitoring System, 10 years of capacity building. So we looked at um, four pillars, satellite land monitoring system, forest reference levels, those are the two um, higher bars here on the graph. And then the two blue um, represent national forest inventory and national GG inventory systems. So as you can see, there are two issues, or two, two messages uh, that come out from this graph. Well, first of all, that there is a substantive progress in capacity development uh, in countries and that it has grown quite rapidly in, from 2014, 15 up to now. And you can see also that satellite land monitoring system and forest emission levels were quite sort of higher, much higher than the National Forest Inventory and the other one, the, the JG. So um, now why is that? Why are those differences so big? And also, um, he's just in this similar, similar message, but just presented in a little different in a different way. Why the progress in capacity development in national forest inventories or GHG was so slow? I think that's quite an interesting issue for us as we want to know precisely how to then channel funds in a more targeted way. And uh, I think one of, the, one of the feedback we've received is that the resource, NFI obviously a resource intense and lengthy process. Uh, many developing countries have little prior experience, so it's a pretty much uh, experience from scratch exercise kind of thing. Also valuing national forest inventories is not always recognized, so often seen as a foundation of organized forestry, um, but only in direct relation to resource management. In terms of GEG, what the feedback we've received from many countries is that the GHG is not really a focus of the UN Red Capacity Building and not typically led by forest services. So here's in an institutional problem because the two, in, you know, the cross-sectorial cooperation as the forest services dealing with the other pillars are mostly um, relevant in ministries of environment or forestry services, while the GHG um, uh, inventories are in, in different departments. So this institutional kind of a bottleneck is really really visible, um, visible here. But the overall conclusion is that um, the progress has been made and uh, this study tells us and shows us, you know, that there are remaining gaps in capacity development and uh, that we can direct these resources that, that, that are available in a strategic way to fill in those gaps where um, were needed in terms of, um, in terms of building these um, capacities. I want to show also another example, and this is an example which deals with some other elements of overall discussion on the definition of transformational change, and also different uh, elements of, uh, for example, GCF investments criteria, where you have an element related to scaling up or replication. Um, here's an example of a, of a simple intervention that was, um, what you see on the slide, it's Panama. Um, you know that most of, uh, Panamian forest, almost 50% is covered uh, uh, through one third percent um, uh, by indigenous territories of the 50% of the forest. And we've been teaming up with some of those um, indigenous communities to um, actually use drones and some other technologies to um, monitor um, forest resources and to monitor actually also other resources. The program became to proved to be very um, small intervention, but very successful. Um, decisions were made by gen general congresses of indigenous peoples, you know, on forest protection, on managing resources, 
So, and it's also a good example of sort of a bottom-up approach, you know, and a small intervention that can be actually scaled up. So there are a number of uh, indigenous groups, which I can list here, but for the sake of time, I know I have to finish very soon. I won't go into details. Um, I, I think that's, um, that's sort of a good example of uh, eventual elements that could be really scaled up and, and, and brought up with, through this uh, bottom-up bottom -up approach. So the issue is here, you know, also how to replicate, what's the replica replication potential? And also from a, a program such as UN Red, how can we sort of program such elements that can be scaled up at very early stages of our interventions? And I think that's something uh, that uh, many um, uh, assistant development agencies could um, could do maybe 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 better, and we can maybe program this better. Okay, so my last two slides are related to um, you know to your key questions. So, what has Red Plus achieved? And uh, maybe Red Plus has not achieved. Uh, what many actors have expected a decade ago, um, rapid and cheap uh, solution to emission reductions in the uh, tropical forest. But uh, maybe those expectations were simply unrealistic. My takeaway message from this slide actually is that there are plenty of intermediate results of Red Plus and also a lot of investments that has been made by developing countries, by Red Plus countries, to actually move forward with those different elements. You have a number of figures here on the slide. For example, 40 countries are moving forward with uh, developing national forest monitoring systems. Uh, quite impressive, big exercise. I have talked about uh, earlier about, um, um, about you know, uh, a progress in this, in this development. A um, number of countries are looking into Red Plus and FLECTI synergies, you know, looking into illegal logging aspects, into governance issues. Several countries are making big progress in safeguards. And uh, last but not least, 50 plus countries have included Red Plus in the NDC's commitment. So I think, uh, I think this is a pos positive development, and I'd like to argue that uh, this uh, recognition of this intermediate results is very important and specifically also a recognition of all the investment made, investments made by Red Plus countries. And I think it's important for us to keep a momentum for change um, with this. Um, and I think I'll skip this. I just want to say also that uh, just to continue on the positive note, I think that Red Plus has some tailwind. And I think that we need to continue this change and keep the momentum. And uh, there are some, some elements where, where I think, you know, some few thoughts for, uh, for a future discussion, you know, technology and technology development, which several speakers before me also pointed out, uh, and innovations and cost effectiveness can provide a lot of, a lot of opportunities, a lot of opportunities to accelerate Red Plus. Growing capacity in Red Plus countries, I think this is, this is very impressive, and also the knowledge um, where to target interventions to actually trigger, you know, further capacity development and to keep the momentum to sustain and to institutionalize the Red Plus infrastructure. We know where this needs to be happening and, 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 and we know how to do that. Uh, you know, uh, maybe I'll also highlight, you know, the commitment of non-state actors. And I think the Marrakesh Partnership, the Climate Action Agenda, you know, a private sector, governance in initiatives, cities, you know, there are plenty of players that are getting more and more aware. And, um, uh, and uh, yeah, I think this is all um, <laughs> good messages, which I would recommend we don't forget about, and we take this into, into account. And I think I'll stop here. Thanks a lot for ending on a positive note. I mean, when we are discussing red, we can, of course, have the endless half full, half empty glass discussion, but clearly pointing to a number of, of tailwinds and uh, maybe you shouldn't use this uh, airplane metaphors if, that, if you should fly less, but anyway, we got the message. Um, we have... Um, a last speaker that I would like to invite to the to the to the podium here, uh, Helen Magata from the Tebteba Foundation in the Philippines. She's the indigenous representative of the uh, or the observer 
for at the GCF, um, you had a long name, an alternative, alternate active observer. You expect indigenous peoples represented to be active anyway, but it stressed the observer for developing countries in, in the GCF, so please. Thank you. Um, I would like to thank the presenters for the very excellent uh, presentations. Um, I think I will just, I, I just want to uh, raise some, some points. And uh, I'm, not an, I'm not a red expert, so my reflections might not be uh, coming from, a, from, a, from the point of view of a natural scientist, but more from somebody from, uh, from the community. So first, I think one of the things that I, I was looking for in the presentation is, th about, uh, is that the talk about human rights human rights, indigenous people's rights. I mean, the, re the remaining 80% of biode remaining biodiversity in the world are in, in indigenous people's territories. However, only 50% of them are managed and accessed by indigenous people's uh, indigenous peoples. And 10%, only 10% are being legally recognized uh, that are owned by indigenous peoples. So when we talk about forests, we don't just talk about carbon and and um, yeah, we don't just talk about how it's going to mitigate climate change, but we also talk, as you you have uh, said, sustainable livelihoods, communities, and we also talk about tenure, access, who decides wh how the, the the land is going to be, for what, and when. Um, another another thing is about evidence. Um, I like how each of you has presented the different evidences of what Red Plus has achieved so far. But I think one of the questions that I also want to see is that how has it changed people's lives in terms of empowerment? What does it mean for an indigenous woman in the Cordillera, that's my community, to have such projects in, in, in their community? Um, and what about other unintended impacts, for example? I know that uh, Red Plus is, is a sticky, sticky uh, issue for, for some communities. And so what, um, what evidences or what are stories beyond the numbers that you have presented about unintended impacts of Red Plus, for example, division of communities, or um, what, does, what does it do to, in, to uh, <coughs> criminalization, for example, of environmental defenders. Um, another one is about participation. When we talk about participation, um, the usual experience is that it talks about national government agencies uh, meeting at the national capital. But what about um, community-based, for example, monitoring and information systems? I saw that the last presentation presented a very <coughs> nice experience of um, how indigenous peoples are using drones to, to monitor their forest. However, unfortunately, this is not the, the case for, for all countries. So, um, how, and how is this going to be connected, for example, to behavior change that uh, Joe has, has said? For example, in the Philippines, we have the National, Green, National Greening Program, and the people would say, oh, we have to plant trees because we are going to get paid for it. So how, how are this project, how are this uh, programs being connected to behavior change? Um, yeah, and the other thing is that I found, well, this is very personal. I, th I found that the, some of the, the presentations are very technical and I am wondering how these are communicated, for example, to communities who are actual uh, managers of their forest and what does it mean to them all of these numbers um, I'd like to I'd like to end by telling a story that um, the the conditional cash transfer in the Philippines for example we went to one community and one of the chief uh, chief of this village came and said um, because the conditions of the program is that they have to go to school 80% attendance of the children to school. They have to go do regular checkups, and they have to, to attend monthly uh, development sessions or educational sessions of this, of, of the beneficiaries. So he said, and then they get 
some amount of money. So he said, I think if, we were, if only we were, we were consulted, we would say, can you, instead of giving us cash, can you give us horse? And that horse should not be named, uh, should, should not be given to me, but it should be given to the community. And the people were laughing. But then he's, he continued to say that, you know, because if you want us to comply with the conditions of the program, and the, the schools are three kilometers, four kilometers away from the village, then how are you expect us? How do you expect us to comply with the conditions of the program? So instead of giving us cash, give us horses, because he said, I know that giving us a, a road might take some time, so maybe horses can be, uh, horses are, are better. So um, yeah, I, I will end with that and would be happy to continue discussion later. Thank you. Uh, you should sit. Thank you so much. And um, there were some questions asked, but I think you will have time to also come back to this. But I would like, I mean, most of the expertise is not sitting here, but in the audience. So I would like to invite questions or comments. Brief, introduce yourself. If there are anyone who would like to start. Yeah, there's a microphone coming. Good evening, everybody. I'm Pascal Martinez. I'm working for the Global Environment Facility, and we finance also part of this uh, this process, in particular the phase two, uh, phase one and two of the Red Plus. And um, and I found very interesting all what you presented in this uh, study in very uh, concise manner, give a good picture. Mm -hmm. And as we try to work with all the other partners, and we invited uh, indeed. Um, by the by the COP also the, by the USCCC to work together with GCF, I was interested to see if in this study uh, you were able to identify the countries that had made um, good use of several funding and and could have made uh, better results because they could use several sources of funding. Because in our project we try always to to invite the countries to use any kind of funding they can and and especially when they are GCF and others. So we'd like to know if you have this kind of perception. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, three more. Um, and we start with Rauni. Good afternoon. My name is Rauni Hajjou, and one of, I'm one of the co-authors uh, with Ireland, Ireland, also in the book which is being launched today. And my question is actually a bit on the critical side of things, uh, well, historically, um, uh, the Global North has donated and has different sorts of, of programs towards the South uh, with a long list of um, uh, requirements. And uh, so in our sort of very strict way of how the money is used, what kind of results, and also the, issue, the, whole, the whole notion of impact assessment emerged from, from the work of the World Bank and what you should see, uh, what's the actual impact of this money. Uh, with RAD, especially with result-based payment, uh, there was a reverse of that logic. So first, a country obtains the result, and then it's given the money as a sort of incentive to, to, to keep going and reducing, uh, without actually, in theory, too many strings attached on how the money are, is used. But as we are seeing now, there's some, uh, some of that logic is also being questioned again. So my question is, uh, would is, are, are we not risking maybe putting so much of a strong burden in developing countries in terms of showing the, the also not only the results but also the effects and impacts of of the money that's being now paid through these different schemes? Thank you. So the question is, are we the one? If the imp you were asking about the impacts, just to rephrase the question so it's clear. Yeah, uh, it's just. Um, if we are both measuring and, and making payments based on results, yeah. and also asking to measure the impact of the money donated based on the result, are we not asking too much? Mm. Okay. That would be a question for, for GCF, where we have result-based payment, payment based on, on the results, but based on past results, and then you ask also the money given for those results to have an impact. That's kind of double... Not double counting, but asking money to work twice. Yeah. <laughs> uh, there was one gentleman there. Uh, hi. Uh, Mark. Yeah. 
Wait, sorry. <laughs> uh, Mark Curry, Nicole de Sciences de la Gestion at UCAM in Montreal. I guess I just have a question about the donor, um, the role that donors are playing in RED, and if there's any comment on the different type of guidance that's been provided by the World Bank Forest Carbon Partnership Facility and UN RED. Was that, who was that to? to that was for uh, Malgo? If, for the panel. Mm -hmm. Okay. There was some behind. Thank you, and thank you for very good presentations. I'm Peter Iversen from the Climate Change Secretariat. I'm from the unit that are responsible for facilitating the technical assessments of the FREL reference level and the results. And uh, I, of course, we did start to talk about RED Plus already came on the agenda in 2005, but we also have to remember that the whole process in here uh, takes some time. So only last time when we were in Poland in Warsaw, did we have the uh, rules about uh, MRV, and then only then could countries start to submit reference level. And so this is five years now, and every year we are receiving more reference level. Now reference level for Red Plus is covering almost 70% of the forest area in, in developing countries. Uh, so we think this is quite a, a good achievement, and in fact we will have a side event about this achievement uh, tomorrow at lunchtime in one of the other uh, side event rooms. So this is more a comment, not really a question, but of course we have to keep in mind that the decision-making process in the COP is not as fast as we maybe something sometimes would like, but uh, so countries of course have to wait until the decisions are there. Thanks. Um, a lady over there. Um. Okay. Maybe on the back. Okay. The lady over there has uh, <laughs> sent her representative to speak for her. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Ilya Simonak is from Manchester Metropolitan University and DesertNet International. Um, thank you very much for your very interesting talks. And I would like to just ask Martin, basically. Um, how close are we getting to achieving um, that the role of remote sensing is taken even more seriously to actually being sure that the reporting is closer to reality? We know that we've had instances where, for example, I think it was 2016, Indonesia reported less deforestation than Ireland. So I can't remember the source of this, but I use it in my lectures quite a bit. So are we getting closer now that we have radar data, sentinels, etc.? to actually being able to use that as a, not a policing sort of, uh, uh, you know, reassurance, let's call it, uh, that the reporting is actually a bit closer to what actually happens on the ground. Thank you. Okay, over here. And we have one more and then we have to have a round of answers. Thank you very much. My name is Nick Beglinger from the Cleantech 21 Foundation in Zurich. I have a question and a comment. The question is um, also directed to whoever wants to tackle it. Countries treat forests very differently in their NDCs. Uh, could you comment on how that relates to Red Plus and Red Plus success in particular, and also give us an overview of sort of the different types of treating forests in NDCs and what your opinions are about that? The comment is quick on the technology. We uh, run the Hack for Climate Innovation program and have several projects that look at the land management space. I just would encourage to uh, look at it uh, from a technological point of view, to include satellite pictures, to include local sensing, and particularly to apply artific artificial intelligence to make the most out of the data that you collect. We have uh, very interesting experiences on how AI can be applied uh, with very interesting results, uh, uh, looking at the past, giving us indications in the future where deforestation is most likely to happen and therefore a way to prioritize uh, development funds. Thanks. I, I think I, there are a couple of more, but maybe I should draw the line. Hopefully we get another round. But um, maybe I can start as we did with Karma first. If there are anything you would like to respond to, for example, that uh, question raised by uh, Raoni on countries, Ecuador, Brazil, are now being 
pay for results at the same time. They sh the, the GCF requires that these money are spent on activities to further reduce which is not exactly the logic of result-based payment, or have I misunderstood? Or maybe Joe would uh, like to join. Also. Okay, uh, thank you. Actually, uh, I was gonna, in fact, ask this question, <laughs> uh, especially uh, because, as I was saying, I'm not much into the technical uh, uh, technicalities of this, and uh, when I was asking about the result-based payment uh, with, within my own context to my country focal point. Uh, for, before, I, I, I'm not going to, I, I don't know the answer, but I just wanted to ask the question myself to some of the experts here. As the moderator pointed out, uh, most of the experts are within the audience and also here. But uh, just to get to the understanding of the, the result-based payment, uh, for, for Bhutan, I was told that uh, it is even not even worth going towards the result-based payment kind of a system because uh, what we are going to be investing is not much uh, going to have a return from that perspective. Uh, so when we were, I think when our focal point is also trying to talk uh, to the GCCF, uh, uh, GCF in terms of the support, uh, I, I think the GCF has also opened up the, uh, the support in terms of the three phases. Uh, so from that perspective, I, I, I don't have the answer, but I just wanted to get some answer from this. And secondly, I would also like to take the advantage of uh, maybe uh, the floor as well as the panelists to ask. Uh, I, I, I just found out with uh, one of the recent survey which was done by the Yale University and uh, Columbia University in terms of the environmental performance. Uh, how, how is there any linkage with the red uh, survey when you do that? Uh, uh, how, how the information being, uh, when it is being used in the red uh, survey or something like that to get the, mon the result on the uh, performance of the environment or something like that. This is, I just wanted to ask, uh, because I was quite surprised to see when I looked at the result that was being uh, published by this, uh, uh, by this uh, 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 Columbia University and the Earth Science, Bhutan is at, at the level of 137 ra ranking in the in environment performance. Mm -hmm. And this has shocked my, my entire, uh, I'm being asked, my, my new government which has come into force recently, how, why is that? Uh, but I don't know because mm -hmm. when I saw lots of presentation here in terms of the red, the, uh, in terms of trying to do the data gathering and also information gathering in terms of the sink and all. Mm -hmm. uh, from my perspective, I was thinking that, uh, you know, Bhutan, we are trying to fight, trying to remain carbon neutral. We are net negative. But then when, when we look, when we have done the forest, national forestry inventory has been done. Uh, I, we are still, in fact, what we have recently submitted to the uh, unit triple C in terms of our sink. In fact, from that uh, inventory, our sink capacity is even more. And then relating to that, uh, given by this expert in terms of red, I thought there was a linkage, and uh, this is just uh, to take advantage of m me not knowing anything on the red plus, but uh, uh, from that perspective, thank you. Sorry, sorry for not being able to no. you know, engage in. Joe, would you like to answer some? And I also have some additional questions. But this, the one I asked, or any other you would like to respond to? Briefly. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, Arad. So on the results-based payment, um, and I'm not very sure, uh, Ronnie, what your question is. Uh, it's not meant to be a grant mechanism. Um, as you know, it's uh, analogous to an impact investment, right? So you are investing for impact, and you have to verify your impact. So it, think about it, and if you think about it, perhaps... Um, in that context or within that framework, maybe, um, so perhaps we can do a bilateral discussion, but um, that might help to also provide some uh, understanding. And like Karma said, uh, the way it's being put together is that there is, of course, there are three phases and there is support also for building the MRBs. So it's not as if it's, um, yeah. So uh, perhaps we've discussed this a bit more. Uh, Aral, with your permission, I, I quickly actually do want to go to a couple of the points that um, I thought uh, Helen made mm. and uh, maybe respond to that. Mm. 
And I thought they were extremely well made because um, if you look at the evidence that's coming out, so if you look at, for example, if you compare joint forestry management with community-based management systems and state-based management systems, the evidence and the last that there was a systematic review that was done in it on this was, I think, in 2015, actually found that joint management systems are just far more effective yeah, that are shared between the community and the state. What it did find, and this sort of, um, uh, and this agrees with a whole lot of other studies as well, is that the impact of this, if all you're looking at is poverty, is actually not very much, so it's very close to zero. But, but also in terms of forestry, forest impact, it's very little. So it's right in the middle of the range that Amy presented, between 0 to 0 0.5, actually they, the meta-analysis showed 0 0.21, yeah? So it's right in the middle, and it really begs the question, you know, should we not be looking at cost-effectiveness studies far more? And also be looking at the core benefits. Very few studies look at core benefits, and we have to start targeting those if we want to think of these as investments. Um, Interestingly, also, four Red Plus countries, so I think it's 47 countries uh, where Red Plus has gone, evidence only exists in 24, uh, or good quality evidence only exists in 24 of those, so just half. Yeah, so I, I think a lot of the questions that you're asking are right on the money. Um, and then the, uh, one more question, and then I'm going to hand it back to the moderator. Um, on your question, Peter, I think, on uh, how does... How do we look at um, the different treatment of Red Plus programs in NDCs? It's, so at least for the GCF, it's country owned. Yeah, the country determines as to what is included as part of you know, def their NDCs, of course, but also what's included in terms of defining what is part of the Red Plus. And uh, the GCF then takes that on. The GCF does pr provide scientific advice but after that, it backs off. Great. Amy, mm -hmm. Helen, ask a question. How has red changed people's life? OK, yeah, there are a lot of other questions that were up for other panels. But I'll just, I, I want to thank Helen for those observations, first of all. I mean, it was, she came in as a discussant and was listening and reflecting really spontaneously. So thank you for that. And I mean, again, also like Joe, a lot of what you said completely resonated with, with what we're learning and seeing. And, and something I didn't mention that I think is absolutely important is this question of participation. And, and we, what we have seen, I mean, not only for, let's say, interventions labeled red plus, but really any forest conservation interventions and, and, and looking at reviews of, of these kinds of things, that really genuine engagement of local people is still a frontier for, for implementers and those who are trying to engage communities. And, and what we've seen is that, I mean, oftentimes, you know, we all know communities are heterogeneous. There are wealthier people, there are men, there are women, there are, there are, there are, there are different, um, you know, power dynamics within those communities. And, and there is a strong risk of enhancing equi inequities that already exist with those who are more articulated, often men, the ones who are more aware of interventions happening in the communities as opposed to women and, and poorer households. And this is something that I didn't mention that, that we did see. And, and, and then how is Red Plus changing people's lives? Well, I don't know. I mean, I think, you know, at least what we've seen so far is that a lot of the let's say, well-being impacts are incipient. And some of that is simply because of, you know, Red Plus and, and some of these interventions really didn't move as quickly as we had hoped. And, and so you aren't actually getting a lot of, of action on the ground and to, to the local people who are, who are really the ultimate beneficiaries of all of this. And, and not only beneficiaries, but also should be considered you know, co-implementers. I think that's, when you said this, we don't want cash, give us horses. I mean, I can't tell you how many times we've heard that in the field. You know, not those exact words, but that kind of idea. So listening to what people actually need and what can support rural development and what can engage them meaningfully in these processes is absolutely key and it's really not happening. Can I just, you're working with proponents. Are they happy to be evaluated with the risk of you coming out and say, Sorry, your COM project had no impact. Amy, are they this happy is, to be assessed by 
Um, You're I guess asking me questions. Um, no, I mean, I think impact evaluation is extremely sensitive, and I think that's also why we don't see a lot of randomization. You know, something like randomization where you're randomizing treatment. I mean, this is highly sensitive, especially if you're not an implementer. And, and I think, I mean, you know, Joe is working on this now. I mean, leading a, a learning-oriented real-time impact assessment of GCF-funded projects. And I mean, I think the whole idea of when you're coming in to evaluate and working with implementers is a partnership and a collaboration. And so it's not calling people out for things they're doing wrong, but understanding the challenges that we're all working towards the same thing, actually. And the point, I mean, what we're trying to do, and I guess what Joe's trying to do, too, is really providing you know, a platform for learning and constructive feedback to be able to improve these efforts. Martin, you had a few questions, but, but maybe summarize, if I try to summarize, it is this that also you and, and Malgo pointed out, that we have increased the capacity, a lot of information. Is that being used to change policies? Yeah, I think that was kind of the end point that I wanted to end up, is, is there is more information, satellite data are used, so all Red Plus countries are using satellite data. Uh, for the reporting free and open satellite data. We have more opportunities, European free and open data sources. Uh, where there is, you know, machine learning and, and artificial intelligence. I mean, there's a lot of stuff that is happening. It's a very dynamic sector. There is more opportunities than what we see. Um, but the pledge was really, I think we have to be better in using that data really to, to get to action. Uh, we have focused a lot on trying to report what's supposed to come out at the end but very little to actually really support action. And I think there's much more that can be done. And we have to think quite differently on how we can make use of that data, how we can use that data with the right people and that kind of stuff. So um, that's where I see the biggest impact of these new evolving things that are happening. And of course, if you have something open and transparent, right, you will have diversity. That's just a, that's a, an unfortunate downside of it. If you have only one data set, then okay, you have one number. If you have two data sets that doesn't necessarily agree with the first one, then the confusion starts. And, but that's an effect that you have. And there, but there are, there are ways to deal with that. We have expert guidance developed. Uh, you know, there, there is some things on how we can advise people to, do, to deal, with, deal with that. But that should not deviate us from the main objectives. We should really get, use it to underpin action. Malgo, yeah. um, I don't know if you Thanks. have any... And Thanks, Harold. And I think I would agree. And my answer to your question would be yes, <laughs> uh, in a short, uh, in a short uh, way. Yeah. But um, I just want to reflect on a few other things which were raised here or earlier. Um, if I got your question right, I think there was something about uh, you know the view from donors, and we are not a donor, and maybe there are some donors in the room, so someone, someone may wish to, to comment on this. But you were also asking about, you know, the, uh, the application of different guidelines, FCPF and uh, UN Red. So UN Red per se does not have any own guidelines. We are fully aligned with UNFCCC process. Um, and then I want to pick up on Helen's comments. And uh, I also try to highlight this in my own presentation. And thanks, Helen, also for bringing this up. I, I, I have um, um, presented, you know, an example of a sort of a one-time intervention uh, case of Panama. But I fully agree that we really need to scale up. And we need to know how to do the scaling up. And I think we, we have still some work to do on this and some homework to do. And we need to learn how to program the scalable components from the very early stages of our program and project's design. And I think that's something what, uh, what's really necessary. Um, and then there was one more comment, I think, from, um, from Pascal here on... Uh, different sources of funding and uh, from our perspective from UN Red and uh, different agencies are supporting number of countries uh, um, uh, working towards Red Plus investments and there is uh, just a, you know a full range of funding uh, that is being considered and a lot of you know uh, mobilization of private sector and, um, and, uh, and private funds and I think that's the only way to move forward to have Red Plus transformational and I'm going to stop here. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah, we have to stop very soon. Just a one last question for Helen here. In the book, we claim that RED has provided a platform for indigenous peoples to raise issues, at least raise them and talk on the national agenda. Would you give RED credit for this? Well, I think we cannot fault indigenous peoples and local communities in, in maybe becoming critical in many 
climate change initiatives because uh, most, well, I would say most of the time, many of these initiatives are usually top down and are being imposed in communities. But I think for Red Plus, it has, well, it, it has opened up a platform for indigenous peoples to raise their issues, but in terms of how effective and how it's going to really change uh, communities and people's lives, this is something that we, we still need to look into. Like, uh, apart from carbon, what core benefits are, are communities really uh, taking or yeah, benefiting from, from all of these initiatives? Thanks a lot, and we have to close now because you're told we have to finish by eight. Last word by Christoph. Well, just very briefly, thanks for being here. We want to uh, provide you a little bit with some results-based payments, so we have uh, some lunch, uh, sorry, dinner, <laughs> lunch tomorrow. No, dinner now. <laughs> if you just walk out uh, the, the back door, to the left, and then you walk in again on the other, in the, in the next room, there is some sort of uh, room with tables, and there should be some food, I hope. Uh, last time we promised it, and then we didn't have it, but this time I think it's there. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. Uh, thanks for being here, and thanks for all the speakers, and I hope you help me giving them a clap of hands, so to appreciate And see you over there.